Okay, so we're going to start now. I'd like to welcome everyone back after the coffee break, and hopefully you got a little bit of uh, extra caffeine. Uh, our next session uh, is Tiananmen 25 years later, uh, the shot seen around the world. And uh, for many of us who live in Asia, no doubt you all know uh, this iconic shot of the tank man. I'm very excited to introduce Jeff Widener, who is the photojournalist who took this photo in conversation with uh, CNN's Christy Lou Stout. Uh, both need very little by way of introduction. So Christy, I'll go and uh, have you uh, take it away. Thank you. All right, Ramey, thank you so much for that. And first, I just want to say thank you, Ramey. I, I told you this before, I'm always in awe of your ability to just organize and to bring people together. And right now, is, it's a very challenging time for journalists and for journalism. We have that downward business pressure on all of us, no matter what media organization we're in. We're also dealing with audiences that are getting increasingly um, picky and finicky. We have to thrill them and delight them, and it's a fragmented audience as well. So we really need opportunities like this to talk to each other, to get tips and best practices on how to forge forward. So Ramey, thank you, thank you so much. And to all the organizers, thank you for putting this together. Now, really, we. Uh, do we need an introduction here? <laughs> we are going to talk about that image. You know, the image known the world over, the symbol of defiance, the lone man standing in front of and staring down a line of tanks. This image um, was taken by Jeff Widener on June 5th, 1989. And it's a symbol of defiance known the world over. It's unfortunately a, a symbol and an image officially blocked out throughout mainland China. It's been scrubbed out of the textbooks, scrubbed out of official media channels there. But nevertheless, it's, it's a global icon. Um, it was taken by Jeff Widener um, during his days as an AP photojournalist. And in the next 45 minutes to an hour or so, I'm going to open it up eventually to Q&A with all of you here in the audience. We're going to talk about how Jeff was able to take this image, how he was able to smuggle it out, the other iconic images, and images that you've probably never seen before that he took during his time there in Tiananmen Square 25 years ago. We'll also talk about his return to mainland China, the reason why he's here in Hong Kong, and he did attend the vigil earlier this week. And finally, what's Jeff working on these days? And his tips for fellow photojournalists out there in the audience. So first, let's give him a warm applause. Let's give it up for Jeff Widener. Now, Jeff, I have to admit for the sake of the audience here, um, this is our second time talking to each other. We had a really delightful conversation earlier um, wearing my CNN cap, now I'm wearing my Asian American Journalist Association cap. Um, and one thing that was pointed out since our conversation were the other images of the tank man when you took this image out there. Um, the uncropped images show not just a line of one, two, three, four tanks, but a long line of tanks. Um, there is also an alternative image taken where you see people crouching down. Um, Kenneth Tam of the Shanghaiist, I know he's speaking here. Hey. He pointed this out, um, another image that was taken from the ground up, and you could see people ducking for cover while the tank man is just standing there. When we look at this image, it looks so still and peaceful. Remind us of the circumstances surrounding when you were taking it, because there were bullets flying over the square and around the vicinity, right? Well, it was pretty, uh, pretty intense. You know, there's other photographs of this. Uh, the ground level one came out uh, on the 20th anniversary. Um, Charles Jones, uh, who was an AP uh, stringer at the time, found it. And it gave a different perspective. But uh, if you look at the other three uh, tank pictures, they're all a bit different in the sense that they have a defiant feel to them. In other words, you know, he's holding the shopping bags, and, and he, you can just see he's very stiff and he's defiant. My photo is uh, different basically because of uh, the gamble that I took to go and get a teleconverter from the bed which would increase the focal length uh, to an 800 millimeter. And in that period of time, he had walked up on top of the tank, and little did I, you know, it's funny, because Time Magazine interviewed me a few weeks ago, and they showed me this video footage, and there was gunfire. And I do not remember the gunfire, so I'm wondering if my, you know, if I blocked that out so, somehow. But uh, the reason my guy is passive is he's just getting ready to leave, and it's, he's making a final stance. And I like my picture a lot because of the Gandhi uh, feel to it. That's what I wanted to get to. Were you waiting for that moment? Because I was looking at CNN archival video, mm -hmm. and he's taunting the tanks. Oh, yeah. He's standing yeah. in front of the tanks. He even at one point gets on top of the tank. He moves to the side. The tank tries to move around him. He moves in front of the tank again. He's very aggressive 
but you capture this moment, as you call it Gandhi-like, that stillness. And that was the moment that you were waiting for, or is a moment that came out and you just grabbed it, the decisive moment? No, I was very lucky. I almost screwed up this picture badly because uh, I had run completely out of film, and Kirk Martin, an American uh, college student that I had met who smuggled me into the, his room, uh, I asked him if he could get some more film. And fortunately, he found some film, but it was one roll, one roll of Fuji 100 ISO film. I normally shoot 800. So even though I loaded it in the camera on automatic exposure and everything was correct, I'm thinking in my mind, looking at the light, that I have a very high shutter speed. When I took the picture, I took one, two, three shots, and then I see 30th of a second. If you know anything about photography, that's an impossible photo. And it was a miracle that came up. And um, to this day, I, I can't figure out how, how that came out. It's just... And it's a miracle that you were able to get the film, get, capture the shot, and also to get the footage out, to smuggle the negatives out. Tell us that story. Yeah, um, Kirk was instrumental in several things. Um, you know, when I arrived there, um, I had to get past secret police. And fortunately, uh, Kirk was standing in the shadows of the lobby. And again, this is the Beijing Hotel. This is the Beijing Hotel. And uh, several journalists were there. The problem was they were using electric cattle prods. And when the journalists wouldn't give up their <laughs> notebooks or their, their cameras, they would get shocked. So I hid all my camera gear. But I still was concerned about being stopped at the front door. And so basically, when I saw Kirk, I went up to him and I said, hey, Joe, what's going on? I pretended like I knew him. And I said, I'm from Associated Press. Can you let me in? He goes, yeah, come on up. And he said, just 10 minutes before I had arrived, a truckload of soldiers came by, and they shot several tourists in the front of the lobby, and they dragged their bodies back into the hotel. He just barely, he barely missed getting killed himself. He hid behind a taxi. So when I got up to the, uh, to the room up there, Finally, eventually, I asked him if he could put all the film together and smuggle it out to the AP office, which he did. And it was funny, because I remember looking down on him over the balcony, and he's walking right by these secret police guys in these white overalls, and they're having a smoke break. And little do these guys know that this long-haired uh, college kid in shorts and sandals is walking right past them, carrying one of the most iconic photos in history, and, and, and also a huge embarrassment for China, right past them as they're smoking cigarettes, gets on the bicycle and pedals away and heads over to the uh, American Embassy where then uh, it was transferred over to the AP office. So it's a, a miracle. He risked his life, a lot of shooting going on, and he had to s sneak his way to the back streets to get that film uh, to the uh, AP office. And if it wasn't for him, that tank picture never would have been seen by the rest of the world. And it's incredible that it, it, that act of bravery, and I put it before, is insane bravery by someone who was a stranger. You total didn't know. Total stranger, total stranger. And uh, I, I, I tried to, for 20 years to find Kirk, oh. to thank him. I lost total contact until the New York Times ran a story on the 20th anniversary. And one day I was at home uh, and on the computer, and all of a sudden my, my AOL said, you've got mail. And I look and said, hi, Jeff. I smuggled my film out in your underwear in Tiananmen Square. Do you oh remember? My gosh. You know? And I just said, God, Kirk, where have you been? You know? And so was, we finally reconnected. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, when you took this image, did you have any inkling, any idea that it would be as impactful as it's become? No. You know, uh, I had a massive concussion from a rock that hit me in the face on uh, the night of June 4th. There was a burning armor car incident. Um, I was so whacked out, so dizzy all the time. I was sick with the flu. You know, when I took this photograph over the balcony, I mean, by that time, after all the things that I had seen, it didn't seem that unusual for somebody to walk out in the street and stop tanks because it was just everything seemed so incredible. Yeah. It was, it was probably, you know, everybody knew it was a good picture, and I won a lot of awards, but it really never sank in until, again, AOL. About 10 years later, they had all these iconic images yeah. uh, from when I was a child in my photo class. You know, Eddie Adams' picture, Vietnam, Buzz Aldrin on the, uh, on the moon, the uh, Hindenburg crash, all these famous iconic photos. <laughs> and then there's a splash of color, and it was my tank man. And I just looked at that, and it's like a bolt of lightning hit me. Like, I finally... That's something incredible. I, I did something really extraordinary, and that's when it hit me, I think, for the first time, 10 years later. And I know I asked you this question already, but I know a lot of people in the audience, they have this question. Who is the tank man? What happened to him? What do you know? You know, uh, who knows? I mean, I've heard different rumors, and um, we really don't know. But what I find fascinating and unbelievable is it's not just one guy. It's the guy, his family, yeah. his relatives. What happened to the tank crew? Where's the driver? Where's the family members of the entire tank crew? There's, there's maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 people, relatives, that are all related to this whole incident that happened. Where are they? 
somebody must have leaked something out. It's like they were all erased from the planet Earth. This is extraordinary. I just I can't figure this out at all. Now, um, you've brought a number of other images that you took in the score 25 years ago. We're just going to click through them. Okay. If you care to yeah, comment sure. on them. Um, you know, every day I would go around 6 o'clock in the morning and I would photograph the students. It was a, a very lively scene. It was almost like a carnival atmosphere. You would have children dancing. Some people were singing. Even police officials would join in with the crowds. And uh, it was just an amazing uh, uh, situation. Um, the uh, soldiers had, uh, sometimes they would come into town, you know, to the center where the Beijing uh, Hotel was near the Great Hall of the People, and they, they started having weapons on them. And uh, so a lot of the protesters, they overtook the buses and actually took some of these weapons away uh, from the soldiers, and then they start displaying them on top of this bus here. So these are trophies collected by the student protesters? Yeah, they're like trophies, you know, and they're also trying to show what's going on with the government, that they're, they're, they're starting to show force by bringing these weapons. This was just amazing. I mean, if anybody in the press corps told you that they were totally unbiased and that this did not affect them emotionally, then I don't think they're being truthful. You, you have a square and you have the do goddess of democracy going up, which is basically a replica of the Statue of Liberty, directly across the street from the giant Mao portrait. So you have this democracy versus capitalism thing going on. And, and, and we were really surprised that the, the Beijing government didn't crack down on it immediately. And so for several days, this was going on. And it was just amazing to see this. And you described it to me earlier as sort of a stare down. The eyes were locked between the democracy statue and the portrait of Mao. Yeah, it was a stare down. And uh, I, I, I can imagine how uh, concerned <laughs> the, uh, the, the leadership was yeah. when, they, when they had this going on. They had to do something. I mean, I, everybody knew this couldn't last forever. Yeah, the symbolism was on them. Yeah. Um, this is the photo you told me when you had the interview with Charlie Rose. It was his favorite photograph. Well, yeah, Charlie Rose, I, um, I, this is like incredible for me. I had an interview of 18 minutes, one-on-one uh, -on -one with Charlie Rose. And Charlie Rose, uh, during the interview, he went on and on and on about this photograph. And uh, so... Uh, and this I, is a Chinese policewoman in the square laughing, singing. W what is she doing? She's just joining in. Uh, I, you know what happened is I think there was so much tension building, and a lot of these soldiers and police were actually very scared because uh, they were not sure if these protesters were just going to get, you know, one thing could set them off and they'd start beating up or, or uh, yeah, hurting them, injuring them. And so I think they ever said, yeah, I'll join the crowd, you know, and yeah, I'm one of you guys, you know, and have a sing-along. It's better to have a sing-along than start being aggressive when you have a mob of protesters around because that, you know, that could go very badly very quickly. There's something very powerful and touching about this photograph because oftentimes when we talk about a report on the state of, in China, it's usually nameless. It's anonymous. You mm -hmm. don't usually see a face as, as part of the apparatus or part of the system. And here's a face and also a very humanizing face who's trying to connect and bring down the temperature and to bring down the tension. Yeah. It's an amazing photograph. Yeah. Um, let's bring up another one. Yeah, here we go. Uh, May 3rd, uh, June 3rd, th you know, finally what we'd been expecting was starting to take place. There was really uh, tension building between the soldiers and the protesters. This girl got, and she was in the middle of this, uh, this uh, scene and she started to take a picture. So, uh, one of the soldiers is trying to drag her away. Uh, another man comes in, tried to push her back to keep her from being taken away. And uh, this is a really good shot. It was a Hail Mary shot. And t take a picture, and then the soldiers start screaming at me, "Don't take any pictures!" So I had to back off. And many of my colleagues and and, and uh, were having their cameras and Leicas smashed on the ground by protesters and soldiers. So, and and Leicas are usually the personal camera of the photographer because most organizations aren't going to spend thousands of dollars on Leicas. So these are our babies, and when you see your baby that's selling for three or four thousand dollars, and they take it, and they smash it on the ground. It's painful, <laughs> believe me. But you really feel the, the kinetic push and pull, the energy in this photograph. Yeah, you know, right? it's one of it's my still, favorite shots from this whole story. That dynamism, yeah. that energy. Oh boy, um, this is when things really start getting pretty uh, hairy. Yeah. Um, the night of uh, June 3rd, it must have been around 10 or 11 p.m., uh, I was near the Great Hall of the People, um, and a burning armor car came around the corner so fast there were sparks coming off the treads. and. That's when I really started getting scared. I jumped into some ivy to get away from it. My reporter dropped his bicycle and ran off, and I never saw him again the rest of the night. You don't know what it's like to physically 
be scared to death and have to get up and run towards the thing that's scaring you because all you want to do is run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. So I took pictures of this scene here, and I'm running out of film and batteries because I didn't bring a lot. I didn't want to be conspicuous. I didn't want to have cameras hanging all over me because I didn't know what the protesters' reaction were going to be. I didn't know, you know if a soldier was going to be around and see me. So I really tried to go light, but I ran out of film and batteries quickly. And so right, you see the rock that guy's holding in his hand? Well, a little while later, right after that, can we go to the next one? Sure. Right after that, I'm trying to get back to the AP office to get more film and supplies. And as I'm, as I'm, as I'm riding the bicycle towards uh, the AP office, this burning armored car comes right towards me. And by this time, I'm literally able to take only one picture every 60 seconds. Can you imagine being on one of the biggest news stories of the 20th century as a photographer, and you can only take one picture every minute? You're going, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. People, one guy was rolling around on the ground. He caught on fire. He's in flames. People are trying to put him out. I can't take a picture. I'm just looking like this, waiting, waiting, waiting. And, and finally, somebody grabs my, my arm, and, I'm, and they're ripping my cameras up, and I'm you know, getting strangled, and I'm, I, I, I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my American passport, and I put it over my head, and I figured it would either get me killed or it would save me. So I just started screaming, American, American. And so some guy came over, you know, and the leader of the pack, and he takes it, and he looks at it, and then he says, okay, you photo, you photo. The crowd moves away a little bit. You look on the ground, there's a dead soldier. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm trying to recycle, recycle, come on. I lift the camera to my face, and boom, my head jerks back. I look down, blood's all over me. The whole top of the camera is ripped off. The lens is ripped off. The mirror's been shattered. The titanium uh, shutter and the camera has been bent. I'm just like... Everything's spinning around, and then I look at the back of this burning armor car. The door opens up. A soldier comes out to surrender. He puts his arms over his head. The crowd looks at him for a second. I still remember his uniform, how pressed it was, how you know, well-pressed it was. The mob moves on to him, and I'm thinking to myself, the, the look of horror in his face, I'm going to lose a Pulitzer Prize. And then I thought I should be ashamed of myself thinking that because he's going to get killed. And so after that, it was time to get back to the office. And I had to get past burning buses. There was uh, red tracers flying over the, great, uh, over the Forbidden City and uh, the Tiananmen Square. And when I got to the AP office, Mark Avery, our photo editor, was there filing pictures. And he was crying. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, one of my Chinese friends was killed. Don't, don't go back out there killing people. And I had to make one of the most difficult decisions in my life. As a journalist, do you want to go back out? I had the flu. I was sick. I was injured. I was scared to death. Or do you go back to your room? And I thought about it, and I, and I chickened out. I just couldn't do it. I could not do it. And you don't know the torment that I felt as a journalist because you're there to cover this event. But there just comes a point that something takes over in your brain, and I guess it's self-preservation, and it just says, don't go any further. And so I felt, I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. And I just was in awe of the courage that these protesters showed out there. And I just felt really badly about the whole situation. And I remember going back to my hotel. And I got there, and I ordered something to eat. I ordered room service, a cheeseburger. And I turned on the TV, and there's CNN. And they got footage of flames coming up from burning you know, buses, and there's soldiers. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this scenario. I'm here in the room eating a cheeseburger, room service, and all these people are down the street risking their life, and I'm in the room. But you know what? I think I made the right decision because a flash when the military had orders to shoot journalists, a flash, I would have been a target. It was suicidal. So I think I made the right decision. It saved my life. Also, Jeff, you, you, you didn't mention a critical detail in your story just then. When you lifted the camera to your face, mm -hmm. you saved your life. Yes. That, actually, the guy who threw that rock and it hit me probably saved my life because I would have gone back out, and I would have got right up to the front lines, mm -hmm. and I probably would have been killed because of the flash. Next photo. Well, by the time a few days had happened, um, everybody in the office was scared. We were just, my, my, I was a nervous wreck. And AP would send this message again, like, well, you don't want anybody to take any risks or to try to get killed or anything, but please do it, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, and uh, I'd been drawing the, the small straws like two times in a row. And so, okay, fine, I'll do it. You know, uh, basically, Mark Avery said, well, i got to edit a film. And then Lu Hunxing, who was our American photographer out of New Delhi, he says, well, I'm Chinese. You know, they see me, they're going to shoot me. So I'm the lucky guy again. So I have to go out. 
I go on the street out of the diplomatic compound. I see a bunch of people. I walk up to them. They have a picture. I take the picture. I leave, go back to the office. We file the picture. It gets a Newsweek. Ten minutes, maybe. Eight minutes at the most, I took that picture. Boom, a Newsweek. <laughs> it's like the fastest photo I've ever taken in my life. Uh, this is kind of, I, I think it's comical. I mean, you have this, this disaster, and there's these women with these flimsy, you know, brooms, brooms trying Made to do, clean up. Uh, I'll just say one thing quickly. A lot of journalists don't uh, ask me this question, but during the diplomatic compound, uh, there were uh, shootings. There was one incident when a truckload of soldiers was coming down the street, and they just opened fire on the diplomatic compound. Well, I was in a cyclo right next to these trucks, and as soon as that happened, uh, I think go to the next one. I think we, we might have the. Okay, I guess I missed it. I guess it's not in. There it is. Now look at these guys. They're cocked and ready for you know action. And so these guys are all next to me. I go running down a vendor's alley, and my lens goes flying out of my pocket. The one I took the tank picture with smashes onto the ground. It's like a fifteen hundred dollar lens, but you know this is just going on. And I ran as fast as I could. I ran like a scared schoolgirl as fast as I could down a vendor's alley. And uh, I remember huffing and puffing and having to take a break in the direct line of sight of these soldiers. I'm thinking, I'm going to die because I'm out of shape. And so when I got to the end, I saw the American embassy, and I started pounding on the door. And uh, the, the Marine says, are you an American citizen? Bah, 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 let me in. Yeah, 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 miss. Have you got some identification? Yeah, 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 yeah. I reach my wallet. You know, I'm crying. My wallet's up falling on the ground. A business card's coming out. Pulling my driver's license. I put it in the thing. Do you have an American passport? Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> let me in, let me in. So finally he lets me in, but I mean, Jesus, it's so much for my country. <laughs> and it, I mean, this is a photograph of not just a display of military might. They weren't, they weren't shooting at this moment, but they were shooting those guns. The soldiers were shooting. You know, some people comment why this couple's smiling. I think they're smiling because, uh, hey, we're just being ourselves here walking around, you know. They, you know I mean, I think, actually, the soldiers look more scared than they do from, you know. These guys, these guys were cocked and ready. I mean, I, I mean, how can you shoot people in a lobby, tourists, who are obviously non-threatening, and you're just standing in the, tr in the, in the open, uh, you know, hotel lobby, and, and they just start shooting you. That's just, you know, crazy. And um, before we get into talking about your return to China and return to Hong Kong, let me just scroll back to the original image. Um, you got into the topic of how do you operate as a journalist in a hostile environment. Um, a former colleague of mine at CNN said, uh, our job as journalists is when, part of my English, when the shit hits the fan, yeah. we run into the fecal spray. That's our yeah. job. Um, how much of what you do is responding to the instinct as a journalist to run into the hellfire versus fighting the instinct to run away? I've never been one to run towards hostile things, if I can help it. I mean, when I got hired at AP, uh, I, wanted, I wanted as a high-powered, uh, really a uh, really prestigious job in a wire service. I wanted to be an, a foreign correspondent. And I, I recall flying from San Francisco and AP flew us first class because usually that was what you got for your first uh, overseas tour of duty. And it was a fantastic, I landed in Hong Kong, it was, it was really rainy out and I'm looking through the window and I'm starting thinking, you know, I can actually die in this job, you know? And I start thinking about it, I start getting nervous. I hate bugs too, you know, Asia's got them the size of tennis shoes, so I was really getting worried about that as well. Bugs and bullets are really, I don't like. And um, so I thought about that. And I said, well, it'll take three months before, you know, uh, AP gets me, you know, kind of into the system. Horst Fa is a legendary photojournalist and was the photo editor in Europe, Middle East, and Africa for AP. He, he sends a message and says, we want Widener in Jaffna, Sri Lanka. We need him there right now. And three days later, after I landed in Bangkok, I wasn't even checked out of the hotel room. There I am in Jaffna getting shot at by Tamil gorillas in a bunker. Mm -hmm. I've never been shot at in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a hero. I don't, I don't chase after... Uh, you know, tanks and stuff. I mean, that's Tank Man's job. I mean, he's the guy who goes forward. I'm going the other direction. Mm -hmm. So I don't take any unnecessary risk. And uh, some journalists, they want to go in there and they want to chase the bullets. That's not me. I've always tried to be as careful as I can to get the pictures. And you will, you'll get your pictures. And you might get a better picture, but look at Chris Hondros of Getty. He, he did it, and he was famous. He also got killed. So, I mean, you've got to be very, very careful when you're covering these kind of stories. And I'm I've never been one to just, because what good is it? You can't cover any more news if you're dead. Yeah. 
you know? So it's a, it's a good idea to stay alive. Did you receive any hostile environment training before 89 or after 89? <laughs> no, maybe from their accountants, but I mean, you know. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, uh, but no, no, I had absolutely zero training. Well, you know, um, I was in, I was in UPI, I had some, uh, some, you know, I covered the Solidarity riots, I covered a, a few things, the tear gas canisters, some minor gunfire, but nothing like this. This is the, this is the scariest thing I've ever covered. Now I want to ask you about your return to mainland China. Um, we know that this image is just so sensitive. I mean, even on CNN, a while ago we had a, a promo. A tiny, tiny pixel on the screen showed the Tank Man image, and that entire promo was blacked out in mainland China. Really? Um, yeah, it <laughs> was. Um, do you find, has it been difficult for you to, to get back into mainland China? Do you ever feel that you've, you're being monitored or followed when you're in mainland China since taking this photograph? Um, well, all I can say is when I leave China, the people in front of me, the tourists, you know, the, the customs officials looking at their stuff, you know, and he's about 60 seconds stamp it and they're on the way. Well, every time I leave, you know, the guy's sitting there typing things in the, on the computer, like it looks like there's grins, there's frowns, there's all these changes of expressions, and about 20 minutes later, I, he clicks it and I'm finally on my way. So somebody's watching me. Yeah. And I also want to get your feelings about uh, the changes in China since 1989. I mean, the, the Chinese government has yet to fully account for the massacre that took place in around Tiananmen Square 25 years ago, and yet China today is a growing military power. It's an economic might. I mean, what do you think of, of the changes in China since then? Well, it's quite extraordinary. I remember going to Jianghua Hotel when I, when I stayed there in 89, and everybody was very unfriendly. I mean, really rude. And this and the time, Jianghua is still there. The Jianghua is still there, this, and, I, and I stayed there. The BBC flew me back for a 20-year anniversary, and I returned there, and it was just a sentimental thing. And every, the same kind of faded out bamboo chairs in the bar, nothing. I mean, the plate glass window with the bullet holes have been replaced, obviously, but everything else was pretty much the same. But what I was amazed about is how many Starbucks and McDonald's and shops are now there. In fact, in the dusk one time in a shopping area, it was like Las Vegas. I've never seen so many neon lights and colors, and it was just unbelievable. It's very, you know, and I spoke to a woman in Las Vegas the other day who uh, was a tour guide from Shanghai, and, and uh, we talked about uh, Tiananmen. And she said, a lot of people in China actually do know about what happened in Tiananmen. They have software. They can bypass the sensors. But she said that the situation is this. Because of the economic prosperity that's been going on, most Chinese are willing to turn a blind eye to the communists as long as they can you know, have their toys, as long as they can have a good life and, and, and have the basic necessities of life. Um, now, what they think personally and privately, I don't know. But, but this is what she said. So um, you talked about the vigil. And that was, uh, I found it rather emotional because even though a lot, of, a lot of Hong Kong Chinese don't know about Tiananmen, which surprised me, this vigil obviously reminded me there are still a lot of people that remember what happened. And I thought that was quite an emotional moment for me. Um, like, I find it interesting, your, your name card, your business card, <laughs> has a full color photo of the tank man. Um, which would mean when you pass out your business card in mainland China, that could be a subversive act. Um, do you, what kind of reactions do you get when you pass out your name card? And, and have you had conversations with people in mainland China about your photograph? Well, it's interesting. Not, not really, but uh, there was one situation on the 20th anniversary when I took a sentimental walk, you know, towards the square. And when I got there, I, I, you had to go through security now. You know, they really are checking people. And there weren't a lot of people when I went there. It was in this massive square, and, and you have these uh, police guys, and they've got these steely-eyed looks on their faces. I mean, they look like they'll pummel your kidneys just if you look at them the wrong way. Yeah. So I had to be careful, but then I saw this British, uh, uh, British couple, and I walked up to them, and uh, I pulled out my business card, and I said, you know this picture? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. And they said, what? Oh, can we take your picture? And they take it. <laughs> They're taking these pictures, I mean, in front of these steely art, you know, the, these, these police guys, and the police guys are looking at me, what's going on, and I'm posing, you know, tank man's posing right there, you know, <coughs> tank photographer. So that was kind of weird, but um, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I haven't really talked to too many uh, mainland Chinese about it, and if I did, I can tell you right now, that they're, they're probably not going to talk to me. Yeah, yeah. So. Now, 25 years after the Tiananmen crackdown, you chose to come to Hong Kong. Why? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with sentimental reasons. I mean, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, I, I doubt if I'm going to make the 50th. I've never been to one of these vigils before. 
And uh, my colleague and former news editor, Peter Ring, you know, he tried and tried and tried to get me to come here. He said, you, you got to do it. You got to go. And I kept saying, well, you know, I don't know. Finally, I decided to do it. And I'm so happy because I've met so many cool uh, people. Uh, I've, I've reconnected with old colleagues. Um, it, it's just been a lot of fun. And, and it just, it's like a high school reunion, you know? I mean, come on, you know, one of the biggest stories of the 20th century and the 25th anniversary, the silver anniversary comes along. I mean, it just seems like the right thing to do. I'm not an activist. I'm not here protesting or getting involved with all this. I'm here basically for me, I guess. That's why I'm here. Do you take photographs of the vigil? Yeah, but very quickly because, you know, it w I was like an air traffic controller. You cannot believe the amount of interviews that I had one after the other, live, TV, BBC, you know, CNN, uh, Australia, live, Canada, live, everything. And I'm fitting, you know, like an air traffic controller, you know, 20 minute gaps between live television and you gotta, you gotta sound halfway intelligent on each one of these interviews. And it's not easy because my brain just floats all over the place usually. I forget half the things I'm saying, so it's not easy. It's all the rocks to the head. I've had serious <laughs> concussions all through the years, so my short-term memory is pretty bad. Oh, I, I know that, uh, unfortunately, I missed it, your, your visual photograph. Are, are they available for us to see? Is there uh, a place you know we can what? go to find I, them? You know, I'm sorry, but I have been so busy. I haven't okay. even had a chance to even um, to, to try to upload it, and I, I wish I could have had it. But I had a nice shot of all the people around with the candles, and, and uh, it, it, it wasn't a lot. But I really was a miracle that I got there because you know how crowded these trains are? It's insane. It's like, you know, it's like sardine cans in a row just going <coughs> really fast. And I was in those sardine cans. And I managed to get through these thousands of people. And, and Peter was kind of like making a, like a big trench in front of me to get people out of the way so I could follow him. And we got out of there just in time to make another interview. It was uh, really difficult. As a photojournalist, you're also a very keen observer, an observer of people and, and, and phenomena happening around you. What did you observe from the Hong Kong vigil? I mean, what was the mood like? Well, it was almost like um, <laughs> very commercialized when I first got there. Uh, the black t-shirts on sale. Yeah, all that commercial stuff. And I, there's a giant, giant poster of my tank picture. It was all red. And I walked by the guy and said, nice shot, you know? <laughs> So, um, we'd, uh, but by the time we got to the park, you know, it was uh, everybody, it was very dark. But uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. The candles were all lit. It was, it was a very strange sensation. I mean, I've covered candlelight vigils before, but it had kind of an eerie gothic feel to it. It was just really kind of strange. But you could definitely feel the, the, um, the sadness, but the defiance some kind of a mixture of that, and, and it was very moving. It's been 25 years since you took this photograph. How has the Tank Man image affected and altered the course of your career as a photojournalist? It's, um, you know, I'm just a guy who wanted to shoot pictures, you know. I wanted to take photographs. I didn't even want to be a journalist. I just tried to figure out a way to make a buck, you know, and shoot pictures. I wanted somebody to pay for my rolls of film. So I figured I'd get a job in a newspaper. And so uh, the next thing I know, I'm saying, wow, this is great. People are seeing my photographs. They're getting published. I have a byline. And then I just kept going and going. And actually, I started having to be a journalist after a while. And then I became a journalist. And then I decided to travel around the world. I had to get on a news agency. And I just kept going, and then I started making a name for myself with AP, and I covered the Olympics, and my byline was getting uh, on newspapers all around the world. And then the tank man comes into my life. And I, I just was a lucky guy who was in the wrong place at the right time, and this thing fell on my lap. And now I feel like the, the, the poster child for the tank man or something, you know? And I, 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 it's cool, it's really neat. It's opened a lot of doors. I was, at, I was down in Tahiti, and I saw a bunch of guys with their shirts off, and I asked them where they were from, and they said, England. I said, well, I know, but where? They said, Birmingham. And I said, what do you do? And they said, we're musicians. And I said, yeah, are you famous or something? They told me I still had a blank look on my face, and it was kind of an awkward moment. And my girlfriend said, you guys are fantastic. I love you guys. It was UB40. <laughs> so uh, the next thing I know, I told him about the tank picture. And he said, oh, mate, that's great. You want to cover our concert? We'll give you a press pass. And I said, OK, well. And then I went down to Easter Island, and I came back. And while I was in, while I was in uh, my hotel room, I put their music on. And I said, damn, these guys are really good. 
<laughs> and so when I came back, you know, I covered the concert and I photographed them. And I thought, you know, I think I'm going to go back to black and white film, you know, like Jim, Mar Jim Marshall did and, and Annie Leibovitz did back with the Stones. And I thought, this might be kind of cool. So they actually are responsible for getting me back into UB40. my... Oh, UB40 <laughs> is responsible for getting me back in my passion and my love with black and white film. So I ended up getting an album cover with these guys eventually. Oh, really? I've never, I never dreamed in a million years. It's Which album? 24-7 okay. in 2008. It's, a, it's the only album cover uh, where they have pictures themselves on the front of the, uh, the album. And that was the last concert with the original band because they had a pissing match and they split up. Half the guys uh, uh, kind of went different directions. But uh, the other thing I'd like to say, one of the most uh, important things that Tank Man has given me is during that sentimental walk to the Tiananmen Square, I saw a very young lady sitting on the side of the street smoking a little cigar. And I approached her and I said, it's very interesting to see a lady smoking a cigar. She says, not a cigar, it's a cigarette. No, it's a cigar. No, it's a cigarette. It's a cigar. It's a cigarette. We had our first fight. So I found out that she was um, a 31-year-old German uh, English teacher. Um, and and uh, we started talking. And I thought, you know, I'm old enough to be your father. This is ridiculous. And we, went, we ended up in an old tea house during a rainstorm. And I made a five-hour pitch. And I took her to the airport the next day, and there was a slow release on the arm thing. And I said, yes, I got her. We are married the next year, so now we live in Hamburg, Germany together. And that is probably the most uh, important thing the Tank Man has done for me. So his sorrowful deed brought me much joy, actually. You used the Tank Man to hit on the woman who would eventually yes. become your wife. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I, I sat down next to her, and I had my camera bag, and I, and I had a magazine um, with a big article about me. And I pulled it out. I said, I said, I said, hey, remember that tank man, uh, Tiana? Yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. And, and, and she's, I think she was a little impressed. And so that's what happened. We got married. Well, just a moment, a moment ago when you were talking about your return to black and white, um, I fast forwarded to your latest photograph. So could you please tell us about what you're doing today? Okay. You know, when I grew up, I, I looked at all the, the classic photographers like Gary Winogrand, Robert Frank, Cartier-Bresson, uh, Joseph Kadelka, Czech photographer, fantastic. These were classic. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I just poured into this. You need oh. to explain this one in a moment. Okay, Sorry. so I wanted to get into classic kind of street photography. And, and right now the media is in really bad shape. Chicago Sun-Times, you know, they fired like 30 photographers, the whole staff. And I, I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. Did I want to shoot weddings? Did I want to go into corporate photography? And, and most of that stuff takes forever to, to establish yourself in. So I just figured, you know, I'm going to go back to my passion and my love with Leica cameras and Tri-X film. And I'm going to do street photography and try and sell them in the art markets. And that's what I've been doing. And I've managed to get some serious uh, galleries in Europe uh, representing me and selling my work. I've got three, uh, two galleries in the United States. Uh, I've been in several auctions. I just sold a uh, a picture uh, in uh, Limperts in Germany for 1,900 euros that I took last year. And that was a color photograph, actually. But it's, it's, the fact of the matter is, finally, I'm getting out of Tank Man's shadow. And the collectors are finally looking at my other work. So I'll just go along here and give you a quick uh, look at some of the new things I'm doing. This is in Spain. I call it in the bag. <laughs> OK, let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, what's going on here? Well, this is Gibraltar, okay, and they got they got a lot of monkeys out there, and I and I, I I had a Snickers bar that I just got from the gift shop, and I was munching on. It. I walked in, and I literally, uh, really inhaled the Snickers bar the minute I saw this monkey sitting there. I would, I just grabbed the like, I picked it up, shot it, and then he jumped to another urinal. So, um, just wow. classic photography. This is Prague, and when I was in Prague, uh, this is where Joseph Kudelka grew up. And I wrote him a letter. This is my mentor, my hero. And I wrote him a letter. And, uh, and he answered it like three months later with a postcard of one of his pictures. I was so excited. But, you know, this is just classic photography, classic street photography. It's a nice moment. I really love it. I, I love this moment because I can relate to it. How many times <laughs> have we been in a social occasion where you're supposed to have fun, forced merriment, it's supposed yeah, to be beautiful, yeah. and you're kind of like, I want to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> This is uh, Aberdeen, Scotland. And uh, the funny thing about it was Corinna was with me. And I was sitting for th about 35 minutes staring at a puddle of water. And Corinna says, what are you doing? Come on, let's go. I'm going to go shopping. Come on. You know, and she's 30 min 35 minutes she waited for me. And she really got pissed off and started screaming and yelling at me. We had a big fight. And then when she saw the pictures, she changed her tune. 
That one picture literally paid for the entire tr two-week trip to Scotland. I saw several of those pictures. Reminds me of the famous photograph by Bresson with the puddle Cardi and the man. No, that, uh, no, yeah, no, that no. was Cardi Bresson. That Cardi was Cardi Bresson. Yeah. But he was jumping. This guy's walking, so come on. <laughs> I'm working on a project since 2003. In fact, right after the UB40 uh, uh, incident, I, I decided to go back and try to do a serious look of Hawaii, the hidden side of Hawaii, because I've been shooting digital for my newspaper there, the, the Honolulu Advertiser. So I started shooting with the Leicas and started to work on this project on hidden and the dark side of Hawaii. So this guy's just a Waikiki there with a bird on his head. And uh, I thought, it, I, I really like to shooting funky stuff. You're going to see some funky stuff here. Oh, wow. Now, on the island of Molokai, you know, Hawaii's got several islands. On the island of Molokai, there's one place where there is these huge cliffs, mountains, that seals off a little teeny town and a village that nobody can go to. And back in the 1800s, that's where they put all the leprosy patients. And so it's been there for, since the 1800s. It's the last leprosy colony in the United States. There's only a handful of these patients still surviving. It's run by the state. You can't go there without permission. You cannot take pictures without the patient's permission. And I love challenges. And after, after several months of trying, I managed to get in there and photograph some of these patients. And I had the last, probably the only images of most of these patients. They're pretty much all gone now. That was Gertrude. She's a wonderful lady, made great bean soup. Uh, this is in Waianae. I saw this. I, dro I drove down the street in the little back area of Waianae, and uh, I saw this guy sitting there. And I didn't think I had a chance in hell of getting it. He just wouldn't move. I just went up to him, said, how's it going? It's like shaking his picture. <laughs> and then I uh, moved on. You found him that way. I found him like that. He didn't move. I think he he's probably. Part of, he's like part of the tree. That's the tr well. That's why I call it the tree man. Yeah. I call the photo tree man. Yeah. Uh, I think you went too far. Oh, okay. Go to the next one. There we go. Okay. Uh, this was during a car the carnival in uh, Honolulu. I call this chips. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it took me she, a while. She got it. She got it. Eric Estrada. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, this is a bit oh strange. Yeah. Um, I, I usually just not like to say anything about it. I'll let people struggle, but it's uh, it was during how it was during Halloween, so she's getting ready to go out and. And the baby is clearly traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't. I was traumatized. <laughs> wow. I saw this lady working in a Macy's department store. I saw the tattoo. She was pregnant. I asked her if I could take photos when she gave birth. She looked at me like I was a pervert. And then I gave her my website, and about three days later, she says, I've seen your website. Oh, my God, it's fantastic. I really want you to photograph me. The one thing I forgot to tell her is I wanted to take her a picture of her nursing the baby. So I get to the house, and it was, kind of, it was a really small house, kind of a jungle growth kind of little back area. And I said, well, can I take a picture of you uh, nursing the baby? And she says, oh, well, yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. And then her husband was there, and she... She asked her husband, the husband says, eh, I don't care. And <laughs> so finally, we, she's got this T-shirt on, and she's holding the baby. And I said, well, can I help you? And so she's kind of pulling her shirt up. She doesn't want to really release it. And I'm pulling yeah. down. She's pulling up. And finally, I whoosh, ripped it off, and she's kind of covering up. And finally, I got the shot, and she loves the picture. She just loves it. It's beautiful, yeah. Paul Harada, another one of the um, leprosy patients, or Hansen's disease, as you should probably call it. But, I mean, there's a lot of people don't know what that is. Uh, he was a gardener. I think this is a, a, a very nice uh, picture to show uh, who he was as a person. I didn't want to exploit it, you know, by shooting deformities. Like a lot of journalists have gone in there. Well, I wouldn't say a lot because it's difficult to get in there, but they would exploit them, show their finger deformities. Uh, I just no. treated them like people, you know, and th that's why they trusted me. Um, yeah, they, there's a transcendent feeling about it. Um, the interview subject is looking off. Is, is the, I'm sorry, the, the photo subject, is, is he blind? No, he's not blind. No, he was just okay. looking up the uh, the wind was blowing, and okay. he was looking at the trees. You know, it was just I just put him there, and you know. Yeah. And I just I like still lifes. I like everything, you know. So I'm not just locked into people. But this was a nice moment. Uh, it had rained, and there was this nice reflection coming off of it. And this sells in the art market. So people love this on their wall, and 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 I've sold uh, everything you see here. Just about I've sold. 
this is, I call it timeless, and uh, this is Kailua on the other side of the Oahu. Um, and these are all pictures that are going to be in my book on the, sort of the hidden side of Hawaii. Okay, I just got the hand gesture for time. Should we? Okay, 10 minutes. All right. uh, this is, I took a Western <coughs> road trip with Corinna. And I mean, one of the wonderful things I love about what I'm doing now is I can take these vacations, these trips, I can photograph them, I can write the whole thing off on my income tax. And we, we have a beautiful, you know, vacation, and then we sell them in the art markets and, and galleries. So, I mean, can you imagine anything better than just traveling around on vacations and selling your work and having tax write-offs? I mean, it's fantastic. There's a tip for photojournalists out there. Looks like it's still from a movie. It's from Bodie. It's a ghost town. They, they have not restored it. It's in Bodie, California. It's near the Nevada border. If you get a chance, you should go there because it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is, I think, in South Dakota. I call this chain smoker. You're into puns. I try to be f clever. <laughs> um, this is near the Badlands. Uh, I just love this. I mean, I wonder how far this guy's got to go to get his mail every day. I've, I've sold a few of these. I call it tailgating. I did not set this up. Uh, if you think I did, I don't blame you. It was just too perfect. You know, Roswell, where the UFOs, you know, all that stuff. Just sitting out waiting for his girlfriend. She was in there getting cigarettes, I think. Yeah. This is Oregon. Um, we're almost done pretty soon. I call this Lounge Act. It was in Mesquite, Nevada. <laughs> kind of retro, huh? That's yeah. what I love about it. That just... Uh, AIDS patient in Thailand. A child. Ten-year-old AIDS patient. On the floor. On the floor. Where did you find him? Bangkok. W in a where? Uh, I believe it was the Mercy Center, in Bangkok. I mean, they got beds. It's just this kid decided he wanted to sleep on the floor. So I mean, don't go running after him saying you treat your you abuse your children. They're sleeping no, on the no, floor. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, She's a prostitute. I saw her in uh, Jakarta. I asked her if I could photograph her. I call it sassy. No, nothing happened. <laughs> I think, is that the last one? Did you, are you pushing the button? Are you pushing yeah, the button? That's it? So, so that's, that's my new stuff. What do you think? You like it? <clears throat> there you go. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us of how you captured the Tank Man image, how it's affected your career, and updated on what you're working on these days. Now is the opportunity to open it up to the floor and take some questions. Right over here. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. My name is Jaewon Jeff from Seoul, South Korea. And thank you for sharing your distinctive and very funny episodes about your photo footage. Um, let me ask you a question about this. If you have a chance to visit North Korea, which is a very close ally to the That's China. one of the few places I haven't been able to get to. Yeah, um, yeah. I really wish I could have gotten into North Korea. Yeah, if you're allowed to take a photos in North Korea within a day, what kind of photos would you like to take in the near future? I think you're pretty restricted there. It would have been really tough, but I would have been probably, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say because it's so, it's so stiff and you're, you're so controlled there. I, I really can't even begin to know what I would have gotten there, but uh, I really wish I could have. I don't have a lot of time because I've got to go to another thing, but I'll try to take a few more questions. Anybody else? Yes. Thanks. I'm a medical student in Shantou University. Uh, I did a story about Tiananmen last month, and I interviewed um, nearly 20 high school students in Beijing randomly, and uh, uh, more than half of them told me they never heard of Tiananmen, and some told me that they are not interested in it, and it's o so old to them. So my question is for media, how do you let mainland students know the thing if they are not interested in it? Thanks. You know, it's just the way life goes. I mean, I mean I'm sure there's people that remember World War II or the atrocities of, uh, you know, what happened, and they pretty much, they're not thinking about it every day. 
Um, and and uh, that's just the way history goes. And so who knows what's going to happen. You know, it doesn't matter what I think about China. It doesn't, it, 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 it's not up to me uh, or any other journalist. It's up to the Chinese people to make the decision on their future. It's up to them. It's in their hands. And so if they want to accept what the situation is and if they're happy and, and they're willing to uh, go with that uh, direction, that's their decision. And if they want to do something else, that's also their decision. Anybody else? Whoa. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the glasses over there. Yep. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm from Rwanda in East Africa. Oh, hi. Okay. Uh, hi. If you were asked to go in Africa for an, a photography project, where would you go and what would, would you cover? Uh, it's funny you should mention that because I was just in um, Angola last year. And uh, I, uh, I had a lot of fun down there. It was, it was a fantastic place. I photographed uh, all the, 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 um, the folks down there and a lot of the um, churches because we were doing an, a non-government job to, uh, and for the, they were building schools. So I had a lot of pictures of children. I wish I had the time to show you some of the pictures. I will tell you one quickly. Um, I remember we came with a truckload of shoes and uh, these kids had never had shoes in their entire life. And I have one fantastic picture of this small boy. He must have been about nine years old. And he got his first pair of shoes, and he, and he, and he, and he just burst into breakdancing. And I get this shot where he's breakdancing with his new shoes. So I, that was pretty cool. But I really loved Africa. I've been there. I won a Kodak scholarship when I was in uh, high school. I went to Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, when UB40 went to uh, Uganda, I went there for that. And I thought that was a great trip. So I love Africa, and I, I always try to get back there when I can. Anybody else? Yes, you. Hi, my name is Jenny from Taipei. My question is about photojournalism. There are a lot of media out there that have actually asked uh, witnesses and citizens to submit pictures for stories. And that's becoming more and more popular and increasing. So how has that impacted the industry of photojournalism? Um, you know, you guys are the bona fide photojournalist trained professionals, but they're asking more pictures from from witnesses and passerby, how does that affect your industry? Well, I think it's uh, it's really sort of devastated things. For a photographer, I loved going every morning to see the paper in the 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 market, and there's your picture on the front page, or they have a big photo spread. Yeah, those days are pretty much dying out. Now they want you to shoot video, but you know what? Video is it has its place. But somebody asked me in Nikon, they did a a big interview on me uh, in the April edition. And they asked me, you know, what I thought about video. And I said, the video has a place, but going to a, a, an assignment and mixing video with still photography is like taking a chainsaw into a monastery. It says you can't do both. Some's going to suffer. But it's had a huge effect. And that's why I'm going into this, into the art markets. That's why some guys are doing weddings. Because we can't compete against all you guys with your cell phones. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to be a journalist. You can just have to be one guy who was where a plane crash was, and you're there first. And you're going to get a better shot than any trained journalist because you're there. We don't know where the next news event's going to be. So how do we compete against that? And if you're going to give it to the, if you're going to give them to the publications for free, I mean, they're making out like a bandit <laughs> with their advertising and they're getting free photos. And we, we're, we're going to be working at McDonald's. So yeah, it's bad news. It's really not very hopeful for the future. Uh, I'm trying to get to somebody. Okay, yes, you in the back. In the white shirt. Peter, how much time we have? Hi, I am a grand Okay, okay. I'm a graduate student from Shantou University and I really appreciate uh, your pictures and your sense of humor. And here comes my question. Um, my question is that in this digital time, uh, everybody have microphone, everybody have the uh, device to take photos. So how, how can we uh, be, um, as a as a journalist, as a student, how can we to um, judge? How can we to judge the up, up, uh, the most appropriate time to take photos? And what is the most important fa factor for uh, ex uh, ex ordinary fo photos? This is my question. Okay. Um, can you give me some I'm, a, I'm a little confused with the the question. I'm sorry. So. Uh, uh, 
because you know uh, in this digital time every everybody have the uh, necessary devices it's very convenient oh, so you basically want to know how are you going to compete with everybody else out there who's got their yeah, so self how to, how to get get the extra uh, ordinary how to get oh, the so how do you get the advantage against everybody else right yes, yes. okay I don't think you do no um, I, I mean I I, I mean I Newspapers are still functioning, and some of them have skeleton crews. Uh, a lot of magazines are going to online. There may be a time in the future where online uh, publications start actually paying journalists, but um, so far I'm not seeing a whole lot. I think CNN actually does pay for still photography sometimes, but uh, am I right on that? Yeah. I think they do sometimes. Yeah. So time will tell. I think there's going to be a lot of shifts in people and decisions, and. Uh, they're going to have to find different ways and different uh, ways uh, in the media to try to make money. It might shift from photography to kind of a hybrid video photographer to there's all kinds of variations. I mean, journalism's not going to go away. You know, it's it's just going to be modified, and uh, we're going to have to readapt ourselves. That's all. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, this gentleman there in the glasses, gray hair. Yeah, you got it. Sorry, I'm not a gentleman. I'm a lady. No, no, I was, this gentleman back here is the one I was talking to. Okay, we'll do two. We'll do two. Okay, okay. the last two. You first, sir. Yeah, Maybe please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is John Grover. I'm a journalist from Africa. Um, I just wanted to comment on your move to black and white, because what seems interesting about it is it, it kind of reflects the old Ilford 400 ASA that we all got used to. Why that? Why back to black and white? I mean, it seems obvious to me, but I think we should share with the... I think yeah. the... I think it was the, um, I don't know if it was Cardi Brisson or somebody else, he once said, color is vulgar. Um, or another person said, uh, using flash is like firing a pistol in a concert or something. I don't know, it's just that black and white strips all the distractions away. It gets you right to the point. Um, it, it's almost surrealistic, but it's, it's hard to explain. It's just something I'm more attached to. I don't like, I don't take pictures. I like to feel pictures. I like to get into the soul of the subject. I want you to be reminded of an old lover or an old song. I want it to linger for a long period of time. And that's not easy to do. That's difficult to do. But I want, to, I want a single Im a photo to have an impact, <coughs> whereas the, the, the video is a lot more complicated. Uh, it, it's, it'll scramble, and you'll tend to forget it more easily. OK, you there in the front. OK, uh, thanks for uh, Jeff Whitler. I'm, I'm more interested in your last photography about the prostitute, because I'm a journalis journalism student that uh, do most uh, researches and uh, practices into media and gender studies. And uh, based on my uh, participation in some uh, 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 gender movement in uh, Hong Kong and also in mainland China, uh, my experience, uh, my observation is that most of the people who care about uh, gender issues, especially sex workers, maybe are, are, are female and are women leaders. Uh, so, uh, based, so from your experience, you work as a, a, a male uh, journalist, a male photographer. How did you make this? Uh, how did you make this uh, photography? And, uh, and are there some experience that you can share to the other people? Well, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of your question, but basically I can tell you how I, sh I, I did this. I was with a friend of mine. He was an AFP photographer, and uh, he lives in Jakarta. And uh, I, I, I was trying to get into the uh, underbelly of some of the things going on in Jakarta. Like one time we went to a place where they had heroin add add addicts uh, that they kind of chain. They literally have chains around their legs that they can't leave. And I was just trying to get in the nitty-gritty side of Jakarta. I wanted to shoot the prostitutes. And... Um, there was a group of girls that uh, we saw at this one location. I saw one of them, and I asked if I could photograph her. So that, that was basically it. And I just liked the portrait. I just, uh, uh, I, I'm not even sure if I should say she's a prostitute. I should just, you know, let it go. But um, I just liked the photo. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it at that. But, Jeff, I have to say... Thank you so much. As interview subjects go, you are extremely generous, very giving with your stories or experiences and tips and advice for everyone in this room. So Jeff Widener, thank you so much and take care. And also, thank you very much to uh, Chrissy Liu Stout for moderating this one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much.